Good evening. It's lovely to see so many here. I wasn't sure quite how many would turn up, but uh, it's really wonderful to have you here for our first of our Advent talks. And we welcome, of course, Bishop Christopher, who is going to be our speaker this evening. What we'll do is very shortly, Pookie and myself will hand deliver for you a plate of cheese, biscuits, rolls, butter that's all individually wrapped. If at any point you would like more of anything, all you need to do is raise your hands and we shall come and serve you uh, with the appropriate cheese and wine, but we are counting how many bottles you have. <laughs> so, and the offering bag, uh, I repeat, the offering bag. <laughs> <laughs> if you would like to make a donation towards the cost of the evening, then there's a plate as you go out, but don't feel obliged to do so. So, <laughs> I'm going to begin with a piece of poetry from Paula Gooder's book, The Meaning is in the Waiting, the Spirit of Advent. It's called Kneeling. Moments of great calm kneeling before an altar of wood in a stone church. In summer, waiting for the gods to speak, the air a staircase. For silence, the sun's light ringing me as though I acted a great role, and the audience is still. All that close throng of spirits waiting as I for the message. Prompt me, God, but not yet. When I speak, though it be you who speak, through me, something is lost. The meaning is in the waiting. Let's pray. Loving God, at this time of crisis, when so many are suffering, we pray for our nation and our world. Give our leaders wisdom, our health service strength, our people hope. Lead us through these parched and difficult days, to the fresh springs of joy and comfort that we find in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. So we will now come and furnish you with the appropriate plates. Do feel free to talk to those sat next to you and behind you, but when you are not eating, please put your masks back on. Thank you very much. Glad to be here for the second year running uh, to give an Advent talk. And this year, I'm aware that in addition to very good numbers here at St Mary's, others will be able to access and listen and follow the talk from home, thanks to YouTube. And that is a little sign of some of the things which have happened in the course of recent months, as we have tried to hold our praying communities and our parish communities together, both by reaching out with God's love to our communities, but also thinking of ways in which people who have not been able to come yet back to church can join in in other ways, and, and that's a very good thing. I always love coming to St Mary's. Um, there is always such a warm welcome here and a sense of being among friends, and I'm very grateful to Father Grant and to you all for inviting me, taking the risk of having a second Advent talk from me. And the um, subject I've been given is faith in uncertainty, in uncertain times. And it's in a wider context. I was so glad that the theme of your Advent talks is faith, hope and love. Because when I became Bishop of Southwark, just nearly 10 years ago, and this wasn't related to, as far as I'm aware, to my being nominated as bishop, but there were riots in, uh, across the diocese very widely in the summer of 2011. And I went about the many, many places, uh, particularly in my former Episcopal area of Woolwich, where there had been very significant disturbances, and also in Croydon as well. And when I was talking to people out on the streets, people, people weren't very, very disturbed by what had happened, because it was seemingly, this was a year before the Olympics, and the tone had completely changed by 
the following year. But in that year, 2011, people were very disturbed by something that had happened very suddenly, which uh, they could not have predicted or expected. There was no sense of there being the writing on the walls, as indeed this year, very few of us had any sense of what the reality of being engulfed in a pandemic might mean for our daily lives, the lives of our nation, the lives of the nations of the world, who have had to discover and rediscover that our lives are also bound together much more closely than we might ever have realised uh, previously. But as I was going about the diocese in the summer of 2011, um, people were saying to me things which I realised were relating to faith and hope and love. Uh, people were saying comments like, I really believe in this community and I want to continue to give my support and uh, we look forward to better days. That, that, that sense of belief and faith. Um, people were saying, I, I have hope uh, for the future and I have hope in the people of this community and I have hope that if we work together uh, we can actually find a better way of behaving and relating. And also a lot of people were saying, and, and I simply want to be an instrument of God's love in whatever way. And this wasn't just members of our churches, members of faith communities, but that language of, of belief, faith, hope, holding on to hope and love, of course, is a fairly universally accessible language, which I think has something to say to every human being predisposed to being a human being of good will. And so it was resonating very widely. And as a consequence, I issued during my first year as bishop a challenge to the diocese, which was called Bishop Christopher's Call to Mission, Faith, Hope, Love. Um, these three abide and the greatest of these is love. But I have been asked to reflect on faith in uncertainty, in uncertain times. I wonder if you remember, those of you who are familiar with it, that part of Through the Looking Glass where Alice finds out how old the Queen is. It's um, a very topical subject, how old the Queen is. Um, but um, even more venerable than our gracious Sovereign Lady, uh, the Queen replied to Alice, I'm just 101, five months and one day, said the Queen. I can't believe that, said Alice. Can't you? The Queen said in a pitying tone. Try again, draw a long breath and shut your eyes. Alice laughed. There's no use trying, she said. One cannot believe impossible things. I dare say you haven't had much practice, said the Queen. When I was your age, I always did it for half an hour a day. Why, sometimes I believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. Well, sometimes we might be forgiven for thinking that people believe that faith is like this, believing impossible things, screwing up our eyes, clicking our heels, and believing something that's preposterous or impossible. All anyone need to do is to try hard and try again if somehow faith doesn't come to them. But that isn't how the church understands faith. So as we think about the three great theological virtues in this three-part Advent course, let's start at the very beginning. What is faith? I propose we start with the opposite of faith. Is the opposite of faith 
unbelief? Or is it doubt? Or is it faithlessness? Or is it mistrust? We might even think at times that faith's opposite is certainty. But I don't actually think it is any of these. Rather, the scriptures suggest to us that the opposite of faith is sight. Remember for a moment the first verses of Hebrews chapter 11. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And the words of St Paul, we walk by faith, not by sight. These contrast faith not with unbelief or doubt, but with sight. Sight signifies something like the confidence we feel when we navigate ourselves through life. And indeed, navigating ourselves through this year has been challenging, has knocked people's confidence in remarkable ways, has driven some people into isolation, has driven some people into pressure and stress and all manner of difficulty. But sight is the assumption that everything is plainly before us, that we can interpret everything without complication. Faith, on the other hand, takes something else as its compass. Faith, at least a mature faith, does not assume that everything is plain or straightforward. Indeed, unlike sight, faith does not need light because faith, being the gift of God, is its own light. And we are in the season of light in Advent at our Eucharist in Trinity House today that Raymond was uh, present and participating in. I was saying how in our homes we have discovered perhaps things which come very naturally to our brothers and sisters of the Jewish faith and Jesus being brought up in a Jewish family uh, would have been familiar with the importance of hallowing the home as the place where our faith is practiced and taught and how wonderful and rich that is that, that the home is the, is the place where, where, where faith is taught um, but it's also the season of light because a person who was following the Eucharist actually following it on YouTube um, or possibly Facebook I think it was being streamed out on three or four different platforms, who is a part of our safeguarding team, uh, seconded to it for a year. Uh, this person was saying that her background is, is the Jewish faith, as uh, she's from a Jewish family, and how light is so significant at this time of year for the Jewish people, just as it is for Hindu people with Hanukkah. And in our cathedral on Sunday evening, we will have a Sancta Lucia service. And the Sancta Lucia service is from Sweden, and it culminates in walking down in procession uh, through the cathedral with the choir singing uh, the traditional songs and chants associated with the festival and one young woman wearing a crown of candles as the significance of light coming in at this time of year and such a powerful theme of Advent of course when there's a sense at this time of year of the light and the darkness being in, in competition and rivalry with each other. So we explore the significance of that statement that faith being the gift of God is its own light in a moment. And that's very significant in a year like 2020, which has been for many of us and for many people throughout the world a very dark year indeed. Now Advent is a season 
in which the church waits for the light of Christ. But before we think about light, let's think about night. Let's think about the condition in which we find ourselves. I expect some of you know that lovely phrase, air day fadeth quite, we see the evening light. Recall, if we will, the last time we were completely in the dark with only the stars and moon to light us. This is impossible to experience in a big city like London. When I go down to Cornwall, it's, it's much more apparent the power of the night sky than in London, with its street lights and house lights and car headlights and everything else. There used to be a warm looking puddles of comforting sodium yellow. Now it's a hard white LED that's like an acid spill, cauterizing shadows from which the eye has to protect itself. So if you want real darkness in England, you need to go perhaps to Cornwall or to Northumberland or even to the west, down to Exmoor, where a very good friend of mine is rector of 12 churches. Uh, glad you get off lightly in Southwark Diocese. That's in Exmoor. It's perfectly normal to be given by your bishop 12 churches to look after. In those places, you will find dark that is truly beautiful. But what's astonishing is that in the dark there is light. The darker it is down there, the brighter the night. When the Venerable Bede told the story of the conversion of Edwin of Northumbria, he told how one of Edwin's pagan advisers compared this life to a sparrow flying through the Anglo-Saxon hall, coming from the winter storm outside, the snow and the rain, into the brightness and the warmth and the conviviality of the hall for a moment before flying out again. So it is perhaps with us. We fly into life from a darkness of who knows what and out again into a darkness of who knows what. Night surrounds us. There is brightness and warmth in here when we feast. But who can feast forever? At some point, the beer is all drunk, the meat is all gone, the embers are all dead, the Lord and his thanes sleep or sleep it off. Day will come, but so again will the night. And out there in the night shadows are the wanderers, the strangers, those without kin, without a lord, without trust. Edwin's confidant tells him that if the new teaching he hears gives any more certainty to the sparrow's flight, the sparrow flitting in and out, it is rightly worth accepting. So, if the night around the Mead Hall is at least some part of the problem we face, what was it that Edwin saw as the solution? Well, if you make a pilgrimage to St Bede's tomb in the Galilee Chapel of Durham Cathedral, you will see on the wall above the tomb a sculpture depicting these words. Christ is the morning star who, when the night of this world is past, brings to his saints the promise of the light of life and opens everlasting day. Those are very powerful, very beautiful, very profound, very deep words. Christ is the morning star who, when the night of this world is past, brings to his saints the promise of the light of life and opens everlasting day. These words are taken from Bede's commentary on the book of Revelation. Note the realism, the night of this world. Perhaps we have had some experience of that in recent months. And also note the note of hope. When the night of this world is past, the sense of future perfection, 
For Christ brings to his saints the promise of the light of life and opens to us everlasting day. Or as St John has it at the end of Revelation, there will be no more night, for the Lord God will be their light. If the problem is night, the solution is very likely to be light. What remains for us to see is what that light might be, how it operates in us to bring us to that everlasting day. It is worth holding with this imagery because in these uncertain times we've been living through, we have to just go a little bit deeper, I think, to try and understand what the roots, what, what the foundations of our faith are. Advent, as I've already said, is the season in which we wait for the one who is the light of the world. We wait for the one in whom there is no darkness at all, whose coming transfers us from the dominion of darkness and by whom we share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. And the fact that Advent comes each year, that we wait to enter into something that has already happened, ought to remind us that when we talk about the coming of our salvation, we are really talking about our progress in salvation. If we walk in the light, says St John, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. These are very, very powerful words. So, let me be clear, I am not suggesting that Christ needs to accomplish more, that in order to ensure our salvation there is some deed left for him to do. Heaven forbid, no bishop should ever suggest or say that, and I'm not saying it. What I am saying is that this is always about something that is bigger than us. That because of the magnitude of our grasp of what salvation is all about, um, our grasp of it is always incomplete. That it is our duty to progress through good works, or if this is more comfortable way of putting it, by good outworkings. The further we progress in this way, the nearer we reach that point of understanding what salvation is. For many, the thought that a Christian might have to do something in consequence of this is frankly terrifying. I hear the unspoken words, where should I begin? What should I do? There is too much to do. The task is huge, the work thankless, and I am too little and too weak to do anything. If you're thinking any of those things, you're right. In many ways, the night is very dark. There are many challenges. Only a fool would tackle them without a good bit of thought and without a good measure of humility and without quite a strong sense of inadequacy. But there is something to notice each year, which uh, we have a particular experience of what happens when the clocks go back. Around four o'clock, as you turn on the first light perhaps, the dusk suddenly seems to get darker. Light inside the house means that we suddenly perceive less of it outside. It becomes more like a wall. If you try it tonight, I think you'll see what I mean. By this analogy, I hope to express something that happens to Christians often. When we try to comprehend what faith is all about, we know we have the light, but for some reason, instead of enlightening the world around us, we seem to find the world a more shadowy, a more unsettling place. And perhaps that is something this year, uh, a year of a profound uncertainty. And perhaps this happens because we can easily misunderstand 
what it means to have the light of Christ, what it means to walk in that light, how it is in fact that we are illumined. Soon after he became a Christian, St. Augustine wrote a little book called Soliloquies in which he has an argument with his own reason. And at one point, Augustine's reason says that we can understand things about God from comparisons with those things we can see with our eyes. For both the earth and light, I'm quoting now, are visible, but the earth cannot be seen unless it is illuminated by light. Likewise, those things which are taught by the sciences and which anyone which understanding unreservedly acknowledge as completely true cannot be understood unless they are illuminated by something like their own sun. For just as in the sun one can perceive three things, that is that the sun shines, that is that the sun illuminates, that is most hidden God whom you with to understand. These are the three things that he is, that he can be understood, that he makes it possible to understand other things. That's directly from St. Augustine. So let's think about what is happening here. Augustine in a very biblical way is saying that God is his own light. Remember the bit from Revelation I quoted earlier. The Lord God will be their light. And is there a parallel here? Well, God is God's own light. Just as the sun is and shines and illuminates, so God is and shines because communicating himself makes God understandable as he is self-understandable in Jesus. This is what God does, just as shining is what the sun does. In a similar way, just as we see things because the sun shines, so we understand things. If you think how little we think about the sun and all we owe to it, the light of the sun, the warmth of the sun, the fact that the sun shines, if we can be perhaps as unthinking and accepting about faith and about understanding God, then that analogy really empowers perhaps a deeper understanding of what our faith is. There is a difference, of course. We experience God's light, at least in this world, often as an inner light. We remember that in both Matthew and Luke, these evangelists report Christ talking about the whole body being full of light. But what happens when this inner light shines? Do we find the world darkens? Or do we find, in fact, that we can see? Is that the gift? I think there is scriptural reason to support this, that, that that faith is the gift of eyes that can see, that sense of seeing, of sight, of deeper understanding. I hope I'm not going too deeply into all this. For in Christ, as St. Paul puts it to the Ephesians, the eyes of your heart are enlightened, and you know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints. With God, we are not shut in our houses at dusk, turning on the lights, just to watch it get darker. So what then might it mean to have this faith in Advent, in a time of uncertainty? We might prepare for the light of the world, is one of our purposes in Advent, by getting rid of some of those things that we use to light our life in place of him. Those things that bring artificial light 
inside, but which make the world seem darker outside. Perhaps we can keep Northumberland and Exmoor in mind, or Cornwall, because if you can get rid of the artificial light, whatever the acid spill light might be in our lives, we will see that even the darkest night, even this most difficult and uncertain of years, is by God's grace full of the most wonderful holy light. Those are my thoughts, Father Grant. <laughs> I, I am happy to ask any, uh, not to ask, to answer or to respond. I'm not sure I can answer questions, but I can certainly respond to them if, if you have any. I tried to keep the focus on light because I thought that was a helpful way of approaching faith. Any questions about faith, hope and love? Told the greatest of these is not faith but love. <laughs> so the best is yet to come uh, the week after next. <laughs> I haven't yet got somebody for love. <laughs> <laughs> I loved what you said, Bishop, when you said faith gives us the gift to see. Because I think sometimes when you feel that you haven't got any faith, Sight is what you feel you're lacking the most. Yeah. And I think holding on to that sense that faith, when you hold on to faith, gives you that ability to see, is wonderful. Thank you. I wonder what thoughts you have for people who find this is a really dark time and that darkness is overwhelming, how you look to find a bit of light. Yes, well, when I became um, Bishop of Sonic in January of 2011, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury was Ryan Williams, and um, he said to me that um, you will have to find in this very uh, largely populated urban, suburban diocese, uh, where you are deserters, and 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 I think that the light and darkness is significant because because when there is that strong sense of darkness, um, the light becomes even more precious and powerful. That there was I'm not going to be able to remember the words precisely, but many of you will probably know that more accurately than me. But King George VI said in one of his broadcasts during the Second World War um, that, um, that, that people would be walking in darkness but, but they should walk hand in hand with God in, in the darkness and God would be their light. But I can't now remember the precise words without looking them up. Um, but I think there is that powerful sense of light and darkness being very powerful. And, and living with the reality. I suppose the challenge this year has been to face the reality and not to escape from it. And that in entering into that reality, uh, we have had to think about mortality more than we try to do. That is, by and large, a taboo subject in our current um, society. And we have had to think about the power of the light and the reality of the darkness as well. I'm not sure that's an answer to your question. Others may wish to go on. Who can remember the, uh, the saying of King George VI? Yes. Uh, I said to the man who stood at the gate of the year, give me a light, yes. so that I may tread safely into the unknown of the man said, put your hand into the hand of God, that shall be safe from the known way, and brighter than the land. Yes, so terribly important. So, so those really are powerful words, aren't they, that speak to us. So, so another time of real national peril and crisis, as this has been the reality for many people this year, I, I think perhaps those words are powerful. Any 
any other thoughts or comments? Can faith be taught? Um, faith is a gift. But I have always felt that I have learned a lot about faith by learning about other people's faith and learning about the story of those who have taught the faith and what they have taught. So, so I think possibly it's not either or, but both and in answer to your question. <laughs> but it is ultimately a gift. And I think. I think we, those of us who have the gift of faith, um, I think have to have a deep understanding of those who say that they can't approach life through the eyes of faith. Um, because that is their reality as well, and that, that's a very powerful thing. And we will know many people like that. Could you say something about death? You talked about the taboo of death, and at the moment we're at a time where we can't be with people when they're dying, um, and that feels very hard. And I know it's not quite what you were talking about, but I wondered if you had any advice for how we can be, how we should approach death and dying now. At the beginning of the pandemic, um, one of the deacons that I had ordained the previous Peter Tide, so in June of last year, uh, became very ill with a recurrence of cancer that she thought she was in remission of, and uh, went into hospital, Sri Lankan heritage, and a really lovely special person who had worked as part of the hospital chaplaincy team as a volunteer, and, and so was much loved in that hospital and her son and her daughter were initially uh, barred from going to be with her even though it was quite obvious that her life was ebbing away and, uh, and indeed she did die. Um, and the hospital chaplaincy team uh, kept a sort of vigil with her and, and that gave her great comfort. And then the, the, the day before I think she died, her son and her daughter were, were, were allowed to be with her and that gave them great comfort. And at the funeral of only ten people, her ten um, direct relatives in London uh, were all able to come, but no one else, so the people who journeyed with her or worked with her in her work, ironically in medical research in the Tropical Diseases Hospital, um, were, were not able to be with her. The curates, who were part of her, her cohort, uh, were not able to be there. And, um, and I think everyone was very confronted about, about having to face mortality, uh, which, which I have always tried to say, if ever I have taken a funeral, a prayer which says, encourages us to live each day as if it were our last. Now that I think is a pretty horrendous thought for a lot of us, uh, because even those with strong faith, uh, there is that sense of clinging to life and not understanding the very frail threat there is that separates this life from the life in the world to come. This is a very difficult area. So I think this year has confronted us with something that we would Possibly even those of us with a strong Christian faith would usually choose to ignore or not to articulate and has, um, in a sense, put centre stage the utter inescapable reality of our mortality. Um, I think that can only be a good thing. I welcome that, not because of the suffering, but because of getting beyond the taboo and just understanding a little bit more deeply the nature of this journey. I don't know if that answers your question at all, but those are my reflections. Would you say that, um, stand up, um, in my own life, um, I'm 81. Yes. And I have never 
experience my own dark night and so on. No. Um, and I'm not alone in that, I imagine. Yes. Um, and I feel often that because I've never had that experience, the depth of my faith is shut. Is it essential, do you think, that somewhere we should have to experience a dark night of the soul in order to fully um, be aware of the mercy and, and, and of God? Um, I've led a fairly um, uneventful life. I've been very lucky. I'm, I'm very thankful for that. But I read about people who have had a dark night of the soul and the difference it made to them. And I know, I'm pretty certain, that I'm probably going to die without having that experience. Um, and in a sense, I, I want it because I feel that having that experience will make me feel, make me a better Christian and someone who has a much, much deeper faith. Thank you. There is a lot of writing about the dark night of the soul and um, that sense of someone like St John of the Cross going very deeply into what that might be as an experience. But the beauty of life <laughs> and our journey through it, which we hope and pray will be accompanied by a journey of faith is the multiplicity of the form that that journey will take. Um, I, I have accompanied two people this year who I would say have had a dark night of the soul. In neither cases in a profoundly religious way. One, one is a relative of mine um, who has had a very, very hard time and um, has been supported in that by those who have been able perhaps um, to give wisdom and understanding and I can see quite some glimmers of light in this now. Uh, the, the, the other, it was to do with his immigration status. Um, he had been uh, living in this country for over 20 years and was told three or four years ago that what he had done, having never done anything wrong, which was simply to have a job and pay his taxes, that he didn't have the right status to do this. And, and this so um, deprived him of his sense of his own identity that he plunged into the, 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 the deepest darkness. I mean, obviously one can give medical terms for this, but trying to look at it spiritually, which I think was at the core of this, there was this sense of utter abandonment and utter total overwhelming darkness. And, uh, and this person has journeyed through that because of the interventions of others that have become his advocates and have made sure that he now has the status where he can work again. But I think a spiritual sense of what, what does plunge us into darkness. Um, I, like you, have, have not had that experience. And I, I often attribute it to the fact that when I was born, which of course I have no memory of, but I have the memory of, of those who have told me, um, my twin brother and my mother nearly died. And my brother, was, this is in the 1950s, was taken away from my mother and put somewhere thinking that it would spare her suffering if he was just left to die on his own. And as soon as she came to her senses, she said, where's my other son? And um, asked if she could hold my brother. And she had an overwhelming sense that all would be well. And she handed him back to the nurse who thought my mother had taken leave of her senses and said, he will be all right. And, um, and he was indeed. Uh, and his manner of his birth, he had to come up to London for three months in an incubator. There wasn't an incubator where we were born. 
and he needed specialist attention and it's had various health impacts on his future life. But I was talking to him for an hour last night and, and um, he's still alive and kicking. And, um, and, and so we were brought up to see life as gift and blessing. And, and so I've, that, I, that has never, um, I've never felt that that has departed from me. And, um, and I, I haven't plunged into that sense of a, of a dark night. So I think our journeys are so different. And, and the importance of a Christian community is bearing one another's burdens and upholding each other in that journey along the way and learning. We can learn from those who have had a different journey and a different experience to us. So, 81 years and still going. I wish you well. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments or thoughts? Or are your friends ready to say comments? Father oh, Grant, it's nearly half past eight. Should we say comfort? Yes. Are you going to lead it? Would you like me to? Um, why don't you lead it, Jess? <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> I will give a blessing at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop, for your wonderful words. Let's just take a moment of quietness as we come to this time that ends our evening together. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and a perfect end. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. Most merciful God, we confess to you before the whole company of heaven and one another that we have sinned in thought, word and deed and in what we have failed to do. Forgive us our sins, heal us by your Spirit and raise us to new life in Christ. Amen. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have set me at liberty when I was in trouble. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. But know that the Lord has shown me his marvellous kindness. When I call upon the Lord, he will hear me. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. You have put gladness in my heart, more than when their corn and wine and oil increase. Reading from Mark's Gospel, chapter 13, beginning at verse 35. Keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight, or at cockcrow or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he suddenly comes. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. For you have redeemed me, Lord God of truth. I commend my spirit. 
Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. Which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. So let us pray. Father, we are grateful for all that you have given to us, our food, each other, and our health. We pray for those who lack these things that we enjoy. Give us thankful hearts and opportunities to share your gifts with others. We lift before you this country in these difficult days and pray that you would protect us, encourage us and keep us. Amen. Stir up your power, O God, and come among us. Heal our wounds, calm our fears, and give us peace. Through Jesus our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. As our Saviour has taught us, so we pray to him. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, give us grace so to cast away the works of darkness and to put upon us the armour of light. Now in the time of this mortal life, in which your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, came to visit us in great humility, so that on the last day when he shall come again, in his most glorious majesty to judge both the living and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, in unity with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine upon you and scatter the darkness from before your path. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and those you love this night and always. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Thank you all very much. <coughs> Just a reminder that next Monday we have Archdeacon Rosemary Mallet, the Archdeacon of Croydon, at the same time, 7 o'clock. And so hopefully you will be able to join us there. Thank you.